Archelaus was reigning over Judea in place of his father Herod. He was afraid to go there. And being warned by God in a dream, he departed for the regions of Galilee and came and resided in a city called Nazareth that that which was spoken through the prophets might be fulfilled. He shall be called a Nazarene. Father, we thank you for this, your word. Lord, there are so many wonderful stories, stories of great saints and, and prophets, stories of great men of God and women of God. Lord, so many different characters that we can model our lives after. Lord, we also want to thank you for the stories of those that show us what life is like without you. Stories of great evil, stories of men and women who have chosen to disavow knowledge of you and, and to fight against you and the consequences that they face, Father. We pray that we would equally learn from the great stories of men and women of faith and from these stories of those who have rejected you so that, Lord, we can make the right decisions for our own lives. Lord, we pray that you would guide and direct in our thoughts here today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Well, I want to talk to you about this man named Herod. And the first thing I want to uh, say to you is that Herod tried to stop Christmas because of who he was. Who he was. What do we know about Herod? The first thing we know about Herod, and from history, Josephus wrote quite a bit about Herod, and also from the Bible, was that he was a cunning king. Uh, he sought alliances. His uh, first, or I should say, his marriage after he became king uh, to uh, Mariani, Mariamne uh, was uh, an arrangement for him to gain political influence and political power. In order for him to carry out that marriage, of course, his first wife, Doris, and, and her son had to be exiled. Uh, that's the kind of guy he was to begin with. Uh, he was a great builder of alliances, so much so that the Romans looked to him for control of this unwieldy city and area called Judea and Jerusalem. As Dave mentioned last week, Jerusalem has been conquered and <laughs> reconquered and, and over and over and over again. The, the most uh, changed uh, possession city in the entire world is the city of Jerusalem. Even today, it's considered the capital uh, of two different nations, or at least two different nations would like to have it as a capital. I know Tel Aviv is actually the capital of Israel, but in the heart of the people, it's still Jerusalem, isn't it? And the Palestinian people would also like to have Jerusalem as their capital. It, it is a tumultuous area. It's always facing all kinds of difficulties. Uh, Herod, through force, brought some sense of stability to the region, and the Romans loved him for it. He was a cunning king. He knew how to make alliances with the right people. He made alliances with the Pharisees and the scribes. He made alliances with the leaders in Jerusalem. He got what he wanted out of them, and they didn't have to die. <laughs> What's well, kind of the, <laughs> the main <laughs> uh, way that those alliances went. Uh, he allowed them some freedom. He even did some special favors for them, and we're going to see one of those favors as we look at the, uh, the building that Herod did in just a few minutes. Uh, he was a cunning king, a great builder of alliances, a great builder of buildings and facilities. And I want to show you some of those. Uh, we start off with this picture of stones, and you think, well, <laughs> what's the big deal? with those stones. Well, these stones are still stacked. <laughs> these are pictures of actual walls in Jerusalem. That, the one on the right-hand side, that's the Wailing Wall in Jerusalem. Is there, why would I bring this up? Because Herod is the one who built those. How do I know? Because Herod put his signature on every one of those stones. What, uh, any time in Israel you see a stone that is framed like that, that was a stone that was built by order of Herod, the king. He put his signature on all those stones. The Wailing Wall itself was built 
from the stones that Herod had assembled uh, there. Then the next slide, for the Jews to incur their favor. Now Herod was uh, an Edomite. He was not a Jewish person by uh, birth. He was not a descendant of, of Jacob. He was a descendant of Esau. Uh, but he claimed the Jewish faith as his religion, even though he didn't follow its tenets. Uh, he sought that as an alliance to them. And so he built this wonderful temple. We call it Herod's Temple. Uh, remember, the temple had been destroyed and the people deported. Herod rebuilt the temple. And he rebuilt it to quite a bit of, of grandeur and quite a bit. Herod was never one to, to worry about uh, lack of money because he could always get more from the poor. <laughs> uh, you know, if you ever heard of Robin Hood in those days, <laughs> King John? Herod was even worse than those. He extracted great taxes uh, from the people for all his building projects. But it was, it was a tremendous building. If you look at these little specks here, these aren't just uh, mistakes in the picture. They are actually represent, representatives of uh, how the people would have looked in comparison to scale to the size of the temple. This is a model that Chris and I got to see when we were in Israel, a model of the city of Jerusalem. Note with me up there in the right-hand corner, that's the fortress Antonius. It's the fortress that Jesus was taken to when he was put on trial uh, for his life. Uh, the reason that fortress is adjacent to the temple is because all the rebellion started in the temple. <laughs> and so the Roman guards could look over into the temple grounds to see what was going on there uh, and to see what was happening. There. Uh, this next slide is a slide of Herod's uh, Herod Palace within Jerusalem. And it is, uh, if you were to see it in connection, it's connected to uh, the Fortress Antonios, which is connected to the temple. Uh, it is a, an opulent place. It was an opulent place. Every, every creature comfort was available to Herod. Uh, he had bathhouses that were always hot. He had uh, heated pools uh, that were uh, available in all of his palaces, and he had multiple palaces along the way. Uh, so this uh, was a picture of his extravagance. But go on. Here's another uh, one. Uh, this is a, I, I failed to get a picture of the actual harbor, but Israel did not have a seacoast town. He had a very long, sandy beach. But there was no seacoast town that they could come to. In the days of Solomon, they had captured land where they could put to sea. But Israel itself has no seacoast town. Herod built one. Uh, Caesarea Maritina was a town that he built to have a, its own harbor. And if you were to study this town, I wish I had the pictures that I looked at last night and thought I put in, uh, but somehow didn't make it. A picture of how he did it. He would take barges, build barges on land, fill them with concrete, their concrete. They had a hydraulic form of concrete in that day that would harden underwater. Uh, and they would fill it with rocks in that concrete uh, and float it out. And then uh, when it got to the right place, uh, they would sink it. And they would keep doing that and keep doing that until they built this wonderful harbor. Uh, around this town now that has become a seacoast harbor for ships to come in and out of. That's some of the extravagance uh, of Herod. You can go to that town in Caesarea. My wife and I got to, to see that. Uh, and they have a wonderful uh, display of how it was built and how it was originally. Just a wonderful uh, capture of, of some of the grandness of his building. Here's another one, uh, picture of the aqueduct because the, there was no fresh water for the town. He built hundreds of miles of, of aqueduct uh, to take water, fresh water from the Jordan and to bring it over uh, to this town on the coast. Uh, hundreds and hundreds of miles he had built there. Another picture 
grab a, the next slide, uh, will show one of his other fortresses. If you could look around the corner here just a little ways, you would be able to see the Dead Sea. This is a very arid, dry land here. The Dead Sea is obviously the Dead Sea because no water ever flows out of it. Only water flows into it. Uh, and so this area doesn't get any rain or very little rain. And yet he built this fortress on the top of this mountain. Uh, the rest of the mountain all the way around looks like this site does right here. It's all cliffs. You didn't need to have a wall city around it because the cliffs themselves were the wall. This is Masada. Maybe you've heard in studying about Israel history, uh, Masada, and what happened in Masada about 70 A.D. or, or right around there when, the, when uh, Jerusalem fell and the temple was destroyed, the zealots took refuge in Masada. But Herod built Masada as a winter palace. And in his winter palace, he had, again, heated pools and bathhouses. And you say, well, where did he get the water from? He captured every bit of water that hit that that slope, and it was captured in underground pools so that they had uh, wonderful water. Matter of fact, the zealots were able to last uh, for over a year uh, being sieged by the Romans as the Romans built a ramp, and you can't see it in this picture, but over on this side, uh, they built a ramp. It took them over a year to build that ramp to finally get to the top, and when they got to the top and looked into the city, all the zealots had already killed themselves so they wouldn't have to be killed by the Romans when they were there. But that, it was a tremendous palace. I, I just don't think you can imagine. They have some pictures of it, the grandeur of this palace that was in the middle of the desert, had no other purpose to be there except that Herod could just do it. He had the money, he had the slave labor, he could do whatever he wanted. And he was doing it to prove that he could do it and show how great he was. Another picture. That's a mountain, right? Actually, that was a flat plain. Totally flat plain. Herod built the mountain. Herod had the mountain. It's right outside of Bethlehem. Herod had this mountain built for one purpose. The next slide. You can see the scale of the mountain. He had the mountain built. And this is the day you didn't have D9 cats or <laughs> any of that. Uh, on the inside of the mountain is another one of his palaces. This was to be his burial place. It was to be his tomb. This is where they were going to put his body. And they have discovered the ruins uh, of his tomb uh, within the excavation of this mountain outside of Bethlehem. Here's another picture of it just to show you. It, it just goes down and it's many layers <coughs> as it goes down. Again with pools and, and uh, <laughs> bathhouses and stuff like that. Uh, that's, that's Herod. This, this, this is all modern evidence <coughs> of this biblical char character called Herod the Great. Let's go to the next slide. I want you to see that Herod was a cunning king. He was a great builder of alliances and buildings, but Herod was also a very jealous king. Uh, he was a very jealous king. Uh, Josephus says this. Uh, Astrobalus, brother of his wife, Maranane, was murdered at his direction when Herod was only 18 years old. His crime was that the people liked him. And Herod was jealous of his brother-in-law. In the seventh year of his reign, he put to death Hymenius, the grandfather of uh, Merimene, then 80 years of age. What could an 80-year-old do wrong? He had even formally saved Herod's life. And yet he had put him to death because he had a mild and peaceful disposition, according to Josephus, and the people liked him. He put his beloved wife, <laughs> I don't know how beloved she was, <laughs> to death in a very public execution. And then he had his mother-in-law also put to death soon after. Their two sons, Alexander and Astrobalus, 
thy merriment were also strangled in prison on his orders because he was suspicious that they might try to take his place. In his last sickness, a little before he died, he sent throughout Judea, requiring the presence of all the chief men of the nation to assemble at Jericho, where he was in his sickness. And he put them in uh, what they called the circus. Uh, it was an enclosed area and had them locked in there. And he gave very specific instructions to uh, his family that when he died, that the soldiers were to go into this circus and kill every one of these leading men of Judea. He said, because the Jews hate me so much, that at my death there will be no mourning. But at the death of all these leaders, there will be mourning. So when I die, there will be sadness in the land of Israel. Can you imagine that? You imagine how vile and mean he was. I, I, I'm just. This is just an account of some of the outstanding leaders that he killed, but I want you to know that wasn't all the people he killed. Our guide said, when we went, we were touring these different places and these different palaces where Herod lived. He said, "You never wanted to be invited to a pool party with Herod, <laughs> because he got rid of a lot of people in the pool just by holding them under." until they died. He was an extremely jealous king. So is it any surprise when you read in this scripture where it says that when Herod heard about it, he was troubled. And all the people <laughs> were troubled too. You see, they knew who he was. They knew how insanely jealous he was. They knew what could happen if any pretender to the throne would come. They knew the terrible results that would come. And so everyone was afraid because he was a very jealous king. He was a very brutal king. He was focused on his power and uh, processions uh, and his position. Uh, Herod had it all. He was declared king by Rome. Uh, he had unlimited power. He could, like the queen of hearts, <laughs> say off with her head, and it would be done. He was so jealous of that position and that power that hearing that there was a king born was the worst news he could possibly hear. And so he made plans. Because like the Grinch, his heart was too small to believe or to accept that God would love the world enough to send the Son to the earth. His heart was too small. He already picked his successor, and it wasn't going to be Jesus. Uh, but the good news is the Grinch could not stop Christmas. I'm not talking about the story by Dr. Seuss. I'm talking about this story, the true story. As much as and as hard as he tried, he could not stop. Now, let's pick up the story again. What did he do? Well, he, he gathered 